In Tasmania, there's a business called Beatty's Studio that has thousands of historic photographs. A few people know some of the stories behind these old photos, but no one knows all of them. G'day, I'm John Stevenson and welcome to Forgotten Tasmania. Photography, the art of drawing with light. Capturing a durable image so people can see the past as it really was. From the 1840s, photographers started documenting Van Diemen's Land. In 1879, Scottish immigrant John Watt Beatty said Tasmania was so beautiful it made his soul sing. He kick-started the Tasmanian tourism industry and explored the island extensively, going where no one had photographed before adding to the record of the people, places and events. When he died in 1930, they said his collection was destroyed. It's been largely forgotten ever since. I inherited photos by Beatty and other Tasmanian photographers. The collection had been stored under the house I grew up in, but I had no idea what was in those wooden shoeboxes, until my father passed away and my brother asked me to digitise the old photos. I found an incredible collection. Every photo gives a feeling of amazement, something beautiful, remarkable or unfamiliar. The people of Hobart may remember Beatty's studio, but there's more to the story than Santa photos, portraits and weddings. The history of Beatty's studio is more than Mr Beatty. He gave his name to the business, but it's built on a legacy dating back much further. The first photographs use small pieces of highly polished copper that have been silver plated and treated with chemicals to make them sensitive to light. Invented by Frenchman Nietzsche von Nieps, who also invented the internal combustion engine, the process was perfected by Louis Daguerre and patented in 1839 as the daguerreotype. Only one year later, in 1840, daguerreotype photography arrived in Van Diemen's Land as an official communication to Lieutenant Governor Sir John Franklin. Thomas Bock was a talented painter who's remembered for his portraits of Tasmanian Aboriginal people, made in the 1830s before photography. These paintings were made by studying the actual living people. It's believed that the subjects sat for Bock and the portraits are quite true to life. Thomas was a convict transported to Van Diemen's Land for administering herbs with the intent to cause miscarriage. My guess is that means he was something of a chemist or pharmacist. Skills you would need to be able to use the daguerreotype photography kit, a wooden box supplied with various equipment, bottles of chemicals, plates and instructions. It was very much a do-it-yourself affair. The Directory of Tasmanian Photographers 1840 to 1940 by Chris Long lists Thomas Bock making photos in 1848, working from his studio at 22 Campbell Street. And there's a daguerreotype price list for a Mr Bock of the same address. Although Bock's entry in the Australian Dictionary of Biography makes no mention of this and credits Thomas's son Alfred Bock as being the photographer of the family. Thomas was indeed succeeded by Alfred, who was a successful portrait photographer. He's noted for hand colouring his photographs, but many of them look like paintings because he was a bit heavy handed with the colour. Charles Woolley photographed the indigenous people, controversially known as the Last Tasmanians in 1866. These photographs were incredibly significant today. Samuel Clifford is remembered for his photographs of Port Arthur and his stereoscopic photo cards. 
In 1878, he sold his studio to the Anson brothers. There were three brothers, Henry, Richard and Joshua. In 1882, they employed John Watt Beatty, and in 1891, he bought out the brothers and changed the name to Beatty Studio. Beatty had a long and distinguished career, which is covered in another episode. He sold some of his collection to the museum in Launceston. Beatty died in 1930, and some more was sold to the museum in Hobart, but thousands of negatives remained. A man called Frank Kane had the studio in 1933, and there was a fire. Beatty's cousin and chief publicist, Jack Cato, wrote that everything was destroyed. I disagree with that myth. Beatty's studio operated from McGuffey's in Collins Street until 1934 when they reopened in Murray Street. In 1928, Arch Stevenson had been lured from Launceston by John Watt Beatty. I think Arch liked Beatty's work so much that he got a desire to do landscape photography. In 1934, Arch bought Beatty's studio. He was my grandfather and Beatty's has been in my family ever since. Arch was joined by his teenage son Alberto, who became a portrait photographer. He was my father and he told me that he studied lighting and composition and other skills for the photographic arts. And he modelled his work on the paintings of Rembrandt. Dad won many awards for his photography and he was quite well known in his day. He photographed so many people under the name Beatty Studio that many thought he was John Watt Beatty and referred to him as Mr Beatty. In 1988, my father opened the Beatty Studio Photographic Museum. In 1993, he took the collection to his house and it was shown there for a few years. Dad brought in my brother William, or Bill, and he worked in the studio too. Bill was really the one who saw the value in the historic collection, and he's the one who preserved and spent the most time working on it. So, how one of these uh, negatives would be printed, the negative is sandwiched in this glass holder, like that, and this goes into the enlarger. The enlarger has a light source at the top, is moderated by these sliders here that narrow the light down and focus through this section and the lens and project it onto the paper like this. So there's our image being projected and we get that in focus and we adjust the size that we want and then in the complete dark the photographer would take the um, photographic paper out of the light tight box and place it on the enlarger on the easel like this. Set the timer for the number of seconds required for exposing over here and then activate this foot switch which would project the image onto the fresh paper. And the image would be projected for maybe 30 seconds and then it would switch off on the timer at which point the photographer takes the exposed piece of paper and is developed using these chemicals placed into a tank of developer and then washed and then placed into a tank of uh, fixing agent and finally washed and dried and your finished photograph would uh, come up something like that. Bill was also noted for his wedding photography and he pretty much took over the business when dad was looking to retire. He was also a picture framer, another aspect of Beatty's studio that's sometimes ignored. So this is the workroom. This is where those prints that we saw being developed are then framed and turned into a finished product like this that you can hang in your home. And there's some pieces of equipment around the room that I'm uh, going to point out to you. So this machine, this is a hot press and the finished photograph is uh, quite flexible and needs to be stiffened. So it's applied to a piece of cardboard with a uh, heat transfer process, sort of like double-sided tape, but it activates on heat. So the 
print is uh, placed onto the cardboard and slide into the heat press and then the press is closed and then it um, attaches it permanently to the cardboard backing. And this machine is the frame cutter. This um, takes a piece of picture frame moulding as we call it. So the moulding is placed in the cutter and uh, activated with this pedal and then we end up with a perfect mitre joint like this that can be joined up into a frame. And then the uh, pieces are placed into the joiner like this and joined up like that. And uh, that gives us a fully finished picture frame like this. Our father passed away in 2013 and my brother said we should put the photos on the internet. I stuck my hand up for that job. I'd spent the summer of my 16th birthday working at Beatty Studio, but I chose a career in computers. Bill spent eight years teaching me about the historic photos in the collection, how to print them, how to care for them, and I found a love for them. William passed away in March of 2021, and the studio is now owned solely by me. I get to write the history from now on. I use digital techniques from my decades of experience with computers. I'm going through Bill's things and I've already found many more photos and other treasures that I didn't even know about. There's enough material to keep the documentary series going for years and I love making it and sharing those stories with you. What did Beatty Studio actually do back in the day? Well in the 1800s a photographer did everything. They manufactured and sold photographic film, they took photographs and not just the one type of subject matter like today's specialist photographers, landscape, portrait, headshots, commercial, fashion, paparazzi, etc. A photographer back then photographed everything and anything from wilderness to weddings. Beatty Studio was good at adopting new technology. From the 1850s to the 1950s, the technology of photography evolved rapidly. The material in the collection is a great sample of the different types of technology that make up the history of photography daguerreotypes, the first commercially patented system for storing an image. These early photos degrade if left exposed to light, and they were presented in a folding frame that was kept closed when not being viewed. Glass plates, a massive leap forward in technology, using a silver gelatin process to save the image on glass. Initially large plates of glass were used, later the sizes reduced. The quality of the larger plates is stunning. Sheet film, the next generation of large format film used flexible plastic to support the gelatin silver image, retaining the quality but being much lighter and less fragile than glass. Most of the Beatty Studio portraits are on sheet film. Stereoscopes, two photos taken together that give a 3D effect. Glass lantern slides, projected on a screen using a flame as a light source, these photographic slides were immensely popular, especially in Britain where they were hungry for images of their distant colony, Tasmania. 35mm slides, a progression from glass slides, these were very popular because they were available in very accurate, vivid colour. Panorama, using a clockwork mechanism to advance the film and pan the camera. These captured a 180 degree view on film 36 inches long and 9 and a quarter inches high. The quality is also excellent, clocking in at over a gigapixel. As film became smaller and more flexible, roll film could hold multiple photos, and changing the film was easier and quicker. There's family photos, corporate groups, sporting clubs, events and parades. We've got military, wilderness, vehicles, trains and transport animals and ships. As well as Beatty's material, I restore photos for other people. I've reunited several families with photos of their ancestors that were previously lost to fading, mould and other disasters. Darkroom equipment, wooden developing tanks, enlargers, colour meters, dishes and trays.
Beatty Studio collection has photos dating as far back as the 1840s, although most are in the range of 1880 to 1930. Black and white with some hand coloured, some sepia and a few colour photographs. My primary storytelling is through the photographs. I also re-photograph scenes to show the passage of time. My footage is modern colour HD video. I like to be as cinematic as possible, but also pay homage to the Beattie photos with a similar style, doing what Mr Beattie might have done. He used the new technology of his time, panorama, large format, etc. I like to use innovative new cameras like drones, action and 3D cameras. I add music and sound to further enhance the experience. Beattie narrated his glass lantern slide lectures, so I've narrated my videos. There's no index or historical information with the collection. I'm putting the history back through the website and these documentaries. I'm telling the stories again. So this is my performance of the Beattie Studio collection. In these videos, I'll tell you some of the stories I've uncovered. There's thousands of photos and each one has a forgotten story. We are Tasmanian. These are our stories. This is Beattie's Forgotten Tasmania. You can see the photos from this episode along with all the research, reference and links on our website ForgottenTasmania.com slash episode slash 301. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I will catch you in the next episode. Cheers.